To end this track, last but not least, but we receive Ankit Sopti, CTO and co-founder of Postman, who will continue to tell the story about building an API-first organization uh, right on, on the other side. Hello, Ankit. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Mehdi? I'm doing really great. see you again. We have a great CTO, C-level and co-founders of, uh, of top uh, API uh, companies. Uh, so really glad to have you uh, again at API Days conference. And I don't want to lose mix sometimes of your talk. Please share your slides. The stage is yours to talk about API first organization. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. So hi, everyone. My name is Ankit, and I'm one of the founders and the CTO at Postman. And I'm, I'm really excited to be here to speak with all of you. I think uh, you know it's probably like my fourth time uh, speaking at API Days. Uh, first time virtually, of course. And it's always been a great experience. Uh, you know, full of energy and learning. And uh, so Postman, as many of you would know, is an API development platform. Postman is now used by more than 15 million developers in more than half a million organizations all around the world. And we consider ourselves incredibly lucky to get the opportunity to regularly uh, connect with this incredible community, with our partners, with our customers. And it's been really interesting to see the evolution of how companies are thinking about this notion of API first. We have increasingly seen, you know, even discussions like monolith to microservices being tied to or in some cases entirely replaced now with the strategic organizational goal to be API first, especially as companies look at managing their ever increasing internal API landscape. So what we did was, you know, we used ourselves as guinea pigs and looked inwards at Postman, the organization. And I'm going to use Postman as an example of how we ourselves have evolved our API first thinking through the various stages of our own growth, starting from you know uh, an organization led by two people to now with uh, more than 300 people running the organization itself. So uh, I hope this will give you all a lens to reason about things as you navigate through similar scenarios alongside your teams. So uh, let's start. So at the outset, I have found the way that we approach API first itself has evolved over time. And it's often important to be cognizant of what stage your organization or your uh, immediate set of teams are in and keep this an evolving process. So one framework I often hear about in the, in the ecosystem, which talks about the different stages of evolution is this one, which is zero to one, one to 10, 10 to 100 and so on. And I personally found this to be a very useful segmentation framework because it allows you to prioritize at different stages of your organization or even your team's journey and define playbooks depending on where you are in that process. And the way that I like to label some of these states are zero to one is the stage at which you validate your product. One to 10 is typically the stage at which you're validating your business model with a product that has been partially validated and ready to be uh, you know, uh, sold in the ecosystem. And uh, eventually moving on to this growth stage where you scale the things that worked for you uh, up until now. And it becomes very essential for organizations to manage these inflection points as you transition from uh, one stage to the next. So let's start with talking about Postman's journey itself across some of these stages, starting with uh, one to 10. So organizationally, uh, at the in the one to 10 stage of our growth, uh, our objective was to scale our impact across the API ecosystem by scaling our product to solve for more aspects of the API lifecycle going beyond the API testing workflow, while simultaneously also validating the business model on top of it. Organizationally itself, we grew our engineering team from about 10 to 50 engineers at this point in time. And from a decision-making perspective, we consciously designed our organization to be top-down uh, driven, which organized and aligned people towards these singular organizational-wide objectives. The technical and product uh, decision-making itself was more centralized and explicit to nurture the agility that we needed to, uh, to satisfy the organization objectives that we had set out for ourselves at this point in time. So to, we supported this sort of like centralization of decision-making with a simple lean organizational structure within engineering, uh, breaking it down amongst three teams. Uh, one team that worked on our product directly, you know, the front-end elements, the Postman app, for example, our public API, the, our web app. Uh, the second team, one level below, was our services or our API team that built out the internal APIs that were being consumed by the product teams on top and were building on top of our microservices architecture. And both of these teams were further enabled by this underlying platform team that built and maintained the underlying infrastructure and components 
to enforce some of the centralized decisions that we were making. And our API landscape itself grew in this particular stage. We had about 20 plus microservices that you know uh, we grew, and that essentially, uh, by I would say by design, led to many more internal APIs. And we created a, a lightweight and effective API first process at this point in time in an organization journey to, of course, heavily dog putting Postman, as you can imagine, to manage our growing API landscape. And just one thing to keep in mind was that at this stage, by design, our decision making was top down and more centralized, which meant that informational symmetry across the different people building our product was more controlled and more predictable. So this is how we were doing our API first strategy back then. Uh, we had the API team or our services team, which would basically design the API interfaces. We would use simple constructs like Postman collections with some saved examples before we wrote any code to implement those APIs. We would share these documentations and these collections with our uh, product team and uh, also accompany that with uh, uh, constructs like mock servers. So using these API mocks, our product team was enabled to start the UI implementation simultaneously along with the implementation of the API. And this allowed us to parallelize development between our product and service systems. And at this stage, we also introduced this notion of consumer-driven contract tests to better establish the contracts that existed between our API producers and API consumers. So, and um, I can say with like, you know, uh, great reverence that uh, these consumer-driven contract tests were institutions uh, were instrumental in institutionalizing this resilience that we needed and give this confidence to our API developers to deploy the services independently and confidently without the need for writing expensive end-to-end -end tests. And uh, we also sort of like use contract tests as a tool for API consumers to communicate to our producers of our API about what they were expecting from the API. Kind of like these throwaway prototype, you know, okay, this is you know, if the API worked in this particular way, that would satisfy my uh, use case and sort of acted as an input into the API design process. And objectively, by incorporating this approach towards API first, our version of it aligned with our one to 10 stage of operation. And we were able to deploy it by using some effective tooling that allowed us to gain control into our development process and of course, deliver a, a more uh, mature product. And as with any fast growing company, we soon outgrew that particular stage and we had a validated business model. Our product itself usage was exploding. And we quickly find, found ourselves in the 10 to 100 or the sort of like the growth stage of our journey. And as you can imagine, the organizational objectives itself evolved with a validated business model. And this was the time for us to now invest in growth, which meant taking bigger bets with a broader problem landscape and further scaling our impact in the ecosystem. Around this time, we had about 50 engineers in the team, and we knew that to support that, you know, our vision and the scale of the impact that we wanted to do, our people would need to scale, which means that we would both be increasing the number of people in the team, but also upskilling existing people to take on more decision-making responsibility. And fundamentally, in a way, we knew that this meant that the existing organizational structure design would need a revisit. And uh, at this point in time, from a decision-making perspective, to support this organizational objective of growth, we also felt that a top-down decision-making model itself becomes unsustainable and would need to transition to a model that enables you know, top-down objective or goal setting with you know, using OKR-like uh, tools uh, to create a bottom-up alignment. But the question that we had at this point in time was what teams? Was our product service platform abstraction going to support our growth stage objectives? And how were we giving them the autonomy to become uh, successful? So after much deliberation, we actually settled on this organizational design structure that was inspired by some uh, something that you guys may have uh, seen before, the domain-driven design pattern. So in this model, what we did was we looked at all the different problem areas that we were solving for as Postman. And we created slices of these problem areas along the business needs, uh, creating areas of focus for our teams to excel in. So we, and this is what you call as a domain. So within each domain, we advocated for our users who were, you know, who exactly is facing this set of problems? Why is that a problem itself? How do they currently solve this problem? What are the kind of jobs that are trying to do in their life? And after outlining these, these domains or problem uh, spaces that we were interested in solving for, 
we simultaneously started creating these cross functional slices of the organization combining you know product design engineering and even go to market teams into these teams into the singular cross functional teams which we called as a squad uh you guys probably have seen similar organization structures across multiple organizations uh uh you see the much evangelized uh, squad model at spotify i have seen organizations call these models pods amazon itself refers to a similar model as uh, uh two pizza teams that uh, started with that infamous uh, bezos mandate so the way that we define this squad is a cross functional mission driven team who is given the the resources and the ownership to deliver end to end solutions to a problem domain or as i've often even seen companies refer to it as from concept to cash and in our experience and those of many of our uh, customers uh cultural underpinnings of an organization that is centered inherently around collaboration play a very strong role in the success of operating in this kind of a, a model and what you do when you operate in this kind of a model is you effectively are creating this isomorphism between the organizational architecture the technical architecture and the product architecture putting it all along this singular uh you know form stack and interestingly we see a lot of our you know apart from ourselves we see a lot of our customers operating or wanting to operate in this particular model and it's sort of like interesting to see why businesses want to operate in this way and to answer this question it is also important to look at it from a business perspective because this kind of an organizational design decision uh, is as you can imagine not an engineering only decision and usually activates a majority of your organization to support this and in theory a model that allows you to operate in this squad way the two pizza team way uh what it does is that you you're basically creating these uh, these areas in the organization where you are able to isolate failure where teams could independently isolate each other from the failure of each other our teams are able to independently experiment rapidly iterate on the ideas that they want to do and also from a business leader perspective you are able to create this lightweight model for the newer bets that you want to take if you want to you know tackle a new kind of a problem domain yeah let me just spin up a squad to support that and for each of the teams that you create you are basically giving them the focus and the specific rationale with which to reason about the problems that they want to solve for however on the flip side there are there are costs of building this way the cost that starts with distribution of decision making that often needs a certain level of maturity in the people uh, who are making these decisions decision making often comes i mean i like to look at it as a combination of uh, uh, you know capability context and experience and you often will not find everybody having that uh, ability to make the right or the or a better decision by the by the factors that they have then the other cost that comes in is the one of consistency of of the decisions that you take of the product outcomes and so on and finally there's a significant amount of operational complexity that a company is operating in in such a model so when we started our own organizational transition to operate in this way as you can imagine any organizational restructure itself is complex requires tact and time and as an organization when we settled into this new structure we have had to figure out what api first looks like in this structure and there were a few key points for us to observe so we used this domain dependent design construct with our architectural pattern which gave us a framework for splitting our microservices the domain boundary outlines or gives you the business boundary of a microservice whereas within the domain technical concerns could outline the different boundaries of the microservice itself or in other words when you build a microservices architecture what you're basically saying is that you would ideally not cross one of these domain or business boundaries whereas a single domain or single team could and would probably implement implement and own multiple microservices in essence what you're doing is this cross functional team this squad is becoming the owner of the apis that enable the solution for its own domain of problems and it owns end to end both the interface and the implementation of these apis and their ability to influence business outcomes directly but it's important to realize that you know just the defining of these domains these these circles in this graph is not enough because your organization uh, becomes like a graph and you know the nodes or the squads that you have are fundamentally you know you're equipping them to operate more independently but you are shifting a lot of complexity onto the edges in this graph because what you fundamentally done is that now the organization has shifted from managing fewer larger teams to smaller teams that are heavily reliant on the 
communication and the interfaces that exist within the organization or in our example from 1 to 10 to 10 to 100 stage you see that we shifted from this relatively straightforward two lines of communication to uh, combinatorially speaking like a max of like nc two lines of interfaces and in this model what you're also doing is that you're fundamentally introducing a lot more apis leading to a much bigger internal api landscape and if you look at each of these nodes these squads that i spoke about you're fundamentally creating these two interfaces the first interfacing being the programmatic interface that is of course powered by apis and the second one is this human communication coordination interface with which the teams are going to be working with each other and when you leave such a model of operating unchecked your organizations can often start exhibiting uh symptoms of and i'm going to borrow this phrase from the uh the software package manager world which i read some time ago called as a dependency hell when you start seeing symptoms of you know one team struggles others around it start to get impacted uh you know even though you created this organization for autonomy and independence and the ability to iterate uh you know uh, and fail uh, isolatedly uh the teams itself need to operate together to get anything done and the teams cannot evolve because they have these shared contexts with which they have to operate and what you're often left with is uh you know a, 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 like a distributed monolithic organization because you made that uh you know the uh, the technical architecture and the organizational isomorphic in operate so how do you how do you make this easier and if you choose to operate this way as as i mentioned like a lot of people are thinking about operating in this models right and in my experience the solution has often come down to doing apis better giving that attention to detail to your internal api landscape the same way that you would for your public or uh, partner apis and if you have a, if you create a focus on better programmatic uh, programmatic interfaces with which has better documentation better onboarding it invariably reduces the need for human communication or coordination interfaces that start getting created within your organization and it becomes i mean to put it in a way an api centric approach towards building your organization because the success of your organization is now directly tied to doing api is better and uh, this is an idea that i always come back to something that you know uh, is commonly evangelized and uh, in fact uh, mehdi's book uh, itself covers this really well the notion of api as a product and this is uh, this is a simple but a powerful idea which basically talks about treating your apis like any other product that you offer whether it's your website your mobile app or your physical devices and apply product thinking principles when building out your apis and when you talk about public or partner apis it usually lead now needs less convincing to operate in this api as a product notion uh, especially when you look at the success of api products from companies like stripe or twilio uh, but the true success in my experience and the experience of a lot of our customers comes when you apply this thinking even to your internal or private apis in your api landscape and this in my mind perfectly complements the notion of api first design and api first organization along the following three tenets the tenets of product thinking where you basically are breaking down the problem into smaller you know identification of the right problem statements you select what problems you want to solve for you validate those problems you execute on it and then you sort of on the luxury of doing this all over again where you focus on good documentation and onboarding for your internal apis because when internal apis are com are, are complemented with good documentation uh, and accompany it with onboarding guides it makes your apis actionable so at postman for example we use open api to document our apis and we accompany them with these free form postman collections that often act as onboarding guides think of them like your you know uh, tutorials or follow along examples that become easy to distribute for teams to oh okay you know what like this is how you can you know authenticate yourself and subsequently start using your api fundamentally making your apis actionable and the third tenet being one of developer experience where as a producer you are acknowledging that there is a continuous relationship that exists between the consumer of your api and you have this expectation to support this relationship over time so internally we actually codify these using tools like slos and slas even between individual nodes of the organization and in a grow growing api landscape you kind of have to allow for the easier discovery of your apis uh create that the both the culture and the structure for understanding 
who is consuming your APIs, why are they consuming it, are their use cases being met, and simultaneously you're uh, monitoring your APIs for both errors and uh, performance. And in this isomorphic structure, it's important to realize that you also can't just look at the nodes independently. You also need to look at the graph because you need to often question that, you know, okay, are the nodes correctly defined? Are they talking to the right nodes? Is the directionality of communication itself be between the APIs that you define uh, correct? And uh, we have had to, and obviously this is an ongoing journey, but create these signals of observability for your APIs and uh, build these layers, which brings them closer to the folks who are designing these APIs, because it's important. One thing I often find, find missing in teams is the ability to bring the loop and close the loop to how APIs are being consumed in production and how they come back to the folks designing the APIs. And this evolution itself is something that needs to be constantly done as objectives evolve, as your users and their needs evolve, because you've created better users. And these decisions are important to realize because they also cannot be taken independent of of product and business. All right, so summarizing some of the lessons that you know we learned along the way in our journey. Um, so first of all, organizations are complex and they continue to evolve as organizations uh, scale. And all of this evolution that you see, it's important to be deliberate about it and you know make sure that we are observing the inflection points that occur at the different stages of the organization. APIs themselves are an effective tool that foster the collaboration required for a growing organization, whether it's collaboration between systems or it's collaboration uh, between teams. And when you think API first with this product mindset, you are allowing for organizations to prioritize uh, what is important. For any organization, as you go through, APIs will be a journey and a well-designed API program enables that agility uh, to create that competitive ad advantage that you're looking from an API first uh, organization. Uh, and finally, there is, uh, cannot stress this enough, that effective tooling that complements an organization's growing API landscape is what unlocks that agility and competitive advantage that is required for API programs to be successful. All right, so uh, that's all I had. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was uh, useful and you guys all have a great day full of uh, learning. Yeah, hello, Ankit. We have time, hey. one minute for a question. I will just ask you this one. So you, you on your talk, you mentioned the idea of the Conway's law, right? You know, the mm -hmm. fact that yeah. the organization will follow the software they will build and every communication system they will build will follow the company structure. But then do you would you advise about the reverse Conway's law, Conway's law, right? That producing software in a specific mindset can change how the organization thinks in, is in the structure, right? So... Yeah. Before the people first for, to for technology, the technology for moving people culture. Absolutely, 100%. In fact, I didn't go into detail about that. But what we fundamentally did when we were implementing this notion of squads was apply the inverse Conway maneuver, implementing the domain-driven design architecture pattern. And that is how we started solving for this exact same thing that you just mentioned by looking at the, okay, this is the desired architecture that we want to have and you design your organization communication, uh, organizational communication structure to support the desired architecture. And that starts reflecting in the way that we start thinking about APIs as well. And, and I love the way you, in the squad, you talk about ubiquitous language, because one mm -hmm. of the definition of the microservice is the smallest, u piece, smallest unit of a service that keeps uh, um, uh, a ubiquitous language. You know, yeah, so that's, uh, that definitely fits together. And thank you for the mention of the book, Continuous APA Management. Thank you for that, right? And Kit, it was great to have you. We're just on time. Uh, thank you very much Hello. for being part of APA Days uh, uh, community and delivering a, a talk, you know, that I think will help a lot of organizations to think differently how they organize their software and their teams and how they communicate together. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Keep up the good work uh, with Postman. Uh,